Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. How does the world feel about Jesus? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Often when we live in a Christian community for a long period of time, we can forget what the answer to that question is. How does the world feel about Jesus? Well, there's a theme throughout our readings today that emphasizes what God is bringing in Jesus as being against the current way of the world. Thinking of Jesus versus the world is an odd thought for us as Christians, but that is what's described to us in Luke chapter 6. That what Jesus has come to bring, the message he bears, the person he is, is against the world. And if we take a closer look, we'll begin to see that that's really the situation, not only in Jesus' day, but also in our own. And we will see that the source of that opposition stems from Jesus and the world having very different goals. And I should clarify that what I mean when I say the world is the outpouring of sin from our fall, the bentness of our creation, the brokenness of creation, and what we now desire and what our goals now are, being a part of that creation, Jesus has come to revert them back to what they were intended to be. See, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus is preaching what we call the Sermon on the Plain. And here we see the Beatitudes... But he adds in here the woes. Jesus doesn't just talk about blessed are these. He also says, woe are these. And in the first part with the blessings, Jesus describes the attributes of those whom he describes as blessed. And here's that list. The poor, the hungry now, those who weep now, those who are hated by people, excluded and reviled. Those are whom Jesus describes as blessed. Are you beginning to sense the opposite pattern here from Jesus versus the world? What a list of things to describe as blessed. These are all attributes of people the world would describe as decidedly not blessed. In fact, worldly cultures, ours included, go to unbelievable lengths to avoid being any of these things. For example, the American dream describes the rising up in the socioeconomic ladder of our culture. Going to school and getting a better job so that you don't get stuck being poor. Rising up out of poverty is seen as universal good. So why is Jesus saying Blessed are the poor. Or being hungry, truly hungry, is a cause that many good people have dedicated themselves to destroying, to getting rid of, to eradicating. So how can Jesus say, blessed are those who hunger now? And being hated, excluded, and reviled is perhaps, especially in our own culture, the most unacceptable thing on this list. Our culture has often, to extreme and unreasonable ends, attempted to make it so that everyone and everything and every thought and every belief is not hated or excluded, but accepted and loved. Any form of exclusion or hatred in our culture is the highest of social crimes, and it is to be avoided at all costs. So how can Jesus say that people who experience hatred, exclusion, and revulsion are blessed. And lest you be fooled, these things were all just as unacceptable in Jesus' day as they are today. There's never been a time or a human society where any of these things have been lauded. None of these things have been set as, they've all been set as goals. To not be poor, to not be hungry, to not be sad, and to not be hated. And yet Jesus here is describing all of those things that we put so much time into avoiding as blessings. 
that those people are blessed. And if that isn't strange enough, here in Luke, Jesus doubles down by describing, again, emphasizing this otherness of his message, the opposite as woes. So if being poor was a blessing, he says that being rich, he says, woe to those who are rich. So it's strange enough to describe poverty, hunger, sorrow, and hatred as blessings, but now Jesus describes being rich, full, laughing, and well-liked as woes, as warnings. If you are one of these people, take care, for you have received your reward. What is going on here? Should I be cursed for making a good amount of money or being able to provide food for myself and my family? Should I be cursed for my laughter and joy and being well-liked by all? How does this make any sense? I don't understand what Jesus is saying. Well, to the world, it does not make sense. Remember when Paul says that God chose the foolish to shame the wise. Our world does not understand what Jesus is saying here, but to the Christian, God's word reveals the truth to us. And that is that our understanding of what blessed means is incorrect. Our understanding of what blessed means is changed when Jesus comes into the picture and starts to speak. It has been changed because the goal of Jesus for the world is very different from the world's goals for itself. And they're much better. The key to understanding this difference, this sort of turn that Jesus does here, is when Luke writes in, this, in our gospel reading in this verse, he says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. This is after he lists all those people hating you and excluding you. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Your reward is great in heaven. See, Jesus come to turn the world upside down. His very person, his mission from the very beginning is never what we would expect. It's not a plan that a human being would come up with. Jesus is always found in places he's not expected to be, saying things nobody expects to hear because he's come to turn the world upside down. And that includes us. Because when we fell into sin all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the world became backwards. The world became unlike God intended. All the things that God intended to be a blessing to you have been twisted into curses. What God intended for the flourishing of life have been transformed into a curse that brings separation from him and death. So Jesus is here to redefine blessings and redefine them back to what they were intended to be from the beginning. To be blessed is no longer focused on this world, this life, but on the life to come. Now, this may seem backwards to us, even still at times, but that's because we were once of the world, and a part of that world, our old sinful flesh, still clings to us. It still tries to get us to believe that old definition of blessed, that you're not blessed unless you're rich and full and happy and well-liked. Because the reality of sin in our world is that we're not always those things. So do we stop being blessed when those go away? That's the image of the tree in Jeremiah. The tree that's by the stream, even in the midst of adverse weather, its leaves remain green and it remains firm. We were once these people chasing earthly wealth and earthly reputation. Even still, we get drawn in by the desire for these things. But God knows that they have been turned into something that can lead us away from him. And so now in Jesus, he's redefining blessed. And the way that Jesus redefines it, our world rejects. Christians can have joy in the midst of tears, contentment while poor, 
and be content when others dislike us. Why? Because Jesus has set things right. He has given a new context to being blessed. It is no longer about this life, but the life to come. The New Testament describes being blessed by using the following terms. Possessing grace and peace, holiness and love, sonship through Jesus, redemption, the forgiveness of sins, wisdom and knowledge of the mystery of God's will, salvation, and the Holy Spirit. Notice there's something missing from that list. There's nothing about a full belly, wealth and riches, fame or good reputation. Notice that each of those attributes are focused on the life to come and not the life we live now. Because Jesus has come to change the definition of blessed. This is the context that Jesus is giving this sermon in. For he knows what he's come here to do. The poor, the hungry, the weeping and hated, because of Jesus, they are blessed. What a beautiful gospel message. He's not waiting for them to become rich and full and happy and well-liked before he displays his love in Jesus. Rather, he comes to them as they are now and declares them blessed because of what Jesus is doing, because of the forgiveness of their sins, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, because of the grace and peace which cannot be bought or won in this life, but only given by God through Jesus. Because he knows that these things that this world chases after, that we used to chase after and sometimes still stray from the path to follow, will lead us away from him. And the greatest cruelty of that is once they lead you away, they themselves disappear. For they are only of this life. What God has brought to us in Jesus, what God has brought to you in Jesus, does not pass away. And the person of Jesus himself is the best example of this reality. He was the perfect human being as God intended. And how did the world receive him? He suffered death reserved for those seen as the worst criminals in this world's society. Crucifixion to a cross. The only perfect human being to ever have lived. And that is how the world received him. But our epistle highlights that Jesus' subversion of the world doesn't stop on the cross. In order for all those blessings and woes to make sense, in order for them to really be true, death cannot win. For death is of this world, of this fallen and broken place. It is not of God. It is not of the life to come which is given to you in Jesus. And so he rises victorious. He must triumph over the world. Otherwise, there is no life to come. That's what the point that Paul is making. You have enlisted for potentially a miserable life in this world because you're called to run against it in many ways in following Jesus. And if he has not risen from the dead, then there is no hope in the life to come. There is no life to come, and all you are left with is the misery of this world. But thanks be to God that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. The first fruits of this new life, this new creation, which we are now members of by virtue of his grace. I couldn't help but think of the verse where Jesus says to his disciples, because I felt he was saying it to us here in Luke 6, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. He has risen victorious over death, the ultimate consequence of this world to bring you life forever. Therefore, Paul mentions that if Jesus was not resurrected from the dead, we are most to be pitied. 
but he has resurrected from the dead. And so we are the people with the most hope, the most joy. We can be blessed in the midst of poverty, hunger, weeping, and hatred because we bear the love of our Lord Jesus, the hope of the life to come, that we know that the blessings that we have received from him overcome, swallow up, and exceed anything we can get in this world. I wouldn't change any amount of money for my salvation. I wouldn't exchange the most delicious meal for the forgiveness of my sins. I wouldn't exchange the most well-spoken adulation of my peers for the grace of God and Jesus. And so even if I experience all of those trials, and maybe some of you already have, or maybe you're in the midst of them right now, you are blessed because of Jesus. That's what it means for us now. See, this sermon from Jesus calls us to focus our lives on that which truly matters, the real treasures of what we've been given, the real blessings of what we have. That's why we don't preach a prosperity gospel. Jesus doesn't guarantee that you'll have lots of money. He doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the best job or marry the hottest person or whatever your earthly desires are. But he guarantees you far more, a peace that passes understanding because you know your eternal fate is sealed And it's sealed in the joy and blessing of life eternal in heaven. He offers you the forgiveness of sins. The very thing which separated you from God has now been restored. You can now call God your father because of Jesus. So dear friends in Christ, don't become enamored with the riches of this world. They pass away. Don't give up these eternal gifts for temporary happiness or a full belly. Don't pursue being liked by all. Rather, pursue the truth of Jesus and witness about him even if you are hated for it. For your reward is great in heaven. Why do all of these things? Because in Christ, your sins are forgiven. In Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit. In Christ, you do have grace and peace. In Christ, you do have eternal life. Jesus came into the world in opposition to what it had become due to sin. He came into the world to reverse the goal of this world because this world was tracking towards death and destruction forever. He came to change what it means to be blessed and give you his eternal gifts. So dear friends in Christ, as you go out from this place, You may encounter some of these things, these temptations, these woes. But remember that you are blessed in the midst of your persecution. You're blessed in the midst of your hunger. You're blessed in the midst of your poverty. For your riches lie in the world to come and the blessings of Christ. And the resurrection is proof that all those things are true. So take heart, for Christ has overcome the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes to take us into that new eternal life. Amen.